Well, today we have a very special treat for our message. We have one of our missionaries who we support, Martin Chaya, uh, sharing with us from God's Word today, and his family will introduce themselves to you. Aloha Kailua, I'm Joanna Chaya, and these are our three kids, and I've asked them to introduce themselves to you and tell, them, tell you a little bit about them. Hello, I'm Emily and I'm almost 13 years old. We just started school, we're three weeks in, and we have to wear a mask all day. I'd like for you to pray for me so I will make a new Christian friend. Hi, my name is Julia. Um, I'm 11 years old, my birthday's in October, and I really like art. I'm Mateo, and, I, and I'm five years old, and I like school, and I like to see her as a helper, and I love it to be. <laughs> he likes to be the helper. Well, that's a little bit about us, and we hope it won't be long until we can actually meet you in person and share some meals together or share some conversations where we also get to learn a little bit about you. But for now, aloha and God's blessings on you. Bye. 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 Aloha, Kailua Church. My name is Martin Chaya. You just met my wife and my children. We live and serve in Spain and different parts of Europe as the Alliance Diaspora Ministry Coordinators. So we coordinate the diaspora work. When we talk about the diaspora, we're talking about the dispersion or the spread of people from their home countries. Uh, we have different teams who work among people who have relocated to Europe from the Middle East or others from, from North or West Africa. Uh, today there's something unique and unprecedented that is taking place uh, in the world and that is the movement of people. This has always been happening but it never reached this level. About 250 million people live in countries that are not their home countries. Uh, the people who spend their time to study the movement of, uh, of people basically talk about two main factors. And these two main factors are the push and pull factors. Uh, let's talk a little about the push factor. The push factor happens when people are forced to move out of their own countries. These are people who did not necessarily want to, to move, but because of war or famine or disaster, they find themselves in a situation where they are obliged, where they are forced to pick up and just move and go to a different location or a different country. But there's also the pull factor and that happens when there are some countries because of what they're able to offer, whether it's a better medical service or better education or opportunities for work, they exercise this pull factor, they draw people from, from other places because of these services that they're able to offer to them. So these are kind of the two major uh, factors, if you want, that cause people or are causing people to move around the globe. So we have people moving from any parts of the world to any other parts of the world. And uh, whether it's push or whether it's pull, I argue that this is one of the strategies that God is using today to bring people into his kingdom. I'm just going to give you two quick examples that illustrate that. Let's start with the push factor. You've all been following the news in the last several years about the war in the Middle East and Iraq and in Syria. And because of that, many people were forced to leave their home countries. Several of them had a job and houses and cars and they're living a good life. They, they did not think about leaving, but they, were, they saw themselves in a situation where they had no other option but to, to leave their country. So in Greece, a few years ago, uh, I was uh, present at a conference and several people from Syria stood up to give their testimony. And what's unique about that is that in each one of their testimony, they were saying, praise God for Daesh, for radical groups like ISIS. And it was because these groups, we were forced to leave our home countries and come here to Europe. And it was here in Europe where we met Jesus. So God was able to use that to bring these people into his kingdom. Also another quick example about the pull factor is the number of Filipinos that live today in the Middle East. About two million Filipinos live today in the Gulf and in the, in the Saudi Arabia and many of them are nannies. Many of these these workers are nannies and I don't know if you could imagine you know for a second the impact that these nannies can have on the children that are raising 
in places where it's impossible to send missionaries, yet these people are going there as workers and now their churches realize that they can train them to share Christ effectively, even with these kids at the homes where they're actually working. So God is also using that factor to, to plant the seeds of the gospel and draw people into his kingdom. So whether it's push or whether it's pull, this is one of the strategies that God, God is using. And we have the privilege of working uh, among the diaspora people. Uh, does this have any biblical support to it? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm going to give you a verse from the Bible that kind of tells us or open our eyes to this reality that God uses the move of people uh, to open people's eyes and uh, oftentimes that leads them to, to salvation and to the knowledge of, um, of God. So let's uh, open our Bibles to Acts 17.26. This verse was spoken by Paul when he was actually in, uh, in Greece, in Athens. It was amazing to be there a few years ago as well, in the same place where Paul said these words. And look at the number of the... Uh, um, there were thousands of, of people who have relocated from Syria present there in that same place. So 2,000 years ago, Paul said these words, he says, talking about God, he said, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So this verse tells us clearly that God determined the where and the when of every person. So when people move, that's part of God's plan. Because God is determining where they were to live and then when. So this is part of God's plan. We were not aware of that, my wife and I, when we first um, came to Spain. We were uh, given the task in 2007. The uh, people who were here in Spain, the leaders said, Hey, we see there's a lot of Muslims in Spain. Why don't you come and, and do something? So we were given the task of going around and discovering really what's happening. At the beginning, we thought maybe we'll meet a few hundreds or thousands of Muslims. But we were amazed when we began to look at the numbers and realized that there's, there's, there's millions of Muslims today living actually in Spain and in Europe. 50 million Muslims call Europe home today. At the beginning, when you see all of that, you begin to wonder, does anyone know about this? You know, does, does God know about this? But then, of course, we know he knows about this. And actually, it's part of his plan. Not only he knows about it, he's actually orchestrating that. He's causing that, drawing people from closed countries, moving people from places where the gospel is not able to, to get to them, and bringing them to live here in Europe, in, in cities and in towns where there is access to the gospel. I became also aware of, of this truth of what God is doing when we were about to launch new work in 2009. We relocated to a suburb of, uh, of Barcelona where there's a big immigrant community. The majority of them are from North Africa, from Morocco. They're all Muslims. And there's an evangelical church right outside that community. And the first Sunday there, I decided to uh, go visit that church and introduce myself to the pastor. So I did. The pastor... Uh, named David. He was 80 years old back then. And I shared with him the vision that God has laid on our heart to reach this, uh, this group of North Africans and share the gospel of Christ with them. And Pastor David um, began to weep. And he looked at me and he says, for 40 years I prayed that God actually will send someone to work among these immigrants. And then he said something to me that really helped me understand what God is doing. He said, when I was little, I prayed and I said, God, send me to Africa. But God never answered my prayer. And then he said, God did something different. Instead of me going to Africa, God brought Africa here. And that really helped me to, to understand, to open my eyes to this reality that it's God who's bringing people into our neighborhoods. Now, I know this is maybe also a big topic in the States, uh, the migration of people. And you can interpret this in a lot of different ways. You can analyze it from a socio-political perspective, or you can talk about it from the economical perspective and the consequences of that on, on the economy and the society. But I'd like to invite you to look at it from a heavenly perspective. 
and see it as an expression of God's love to people. The scriptures tell us that God does not desire for anyone to perish, but to come to repentance. To repentance. His love towards human beings compels him to work in such a way that leads people to know him, to repent from their sins, and turn back to him. So one way of doing this is causing people to move. Now what happens when people move? Now think with me for a second here. When people move, their identity oftentimes is shaken at the core. Much of our identity or our value as human beings come from our surroundings. The people that we know, the job that we have, family, friends, all of that gives us a sense of security, a sense of acceptance, a sense of significance. And all of that helps us to create an image. Oftentimes it's a false image or a false identity. But when we are forced to move, all of that is stripped away. All of a sudden we are faced with these big and deep questions that we never had to think about before. Like, who am I? What's my value? What is the purpose of life? Is anyone seeing my suffering? Does anyone care? Now this is hard, hard, but it opens a door for us to examine our beliefs, our faith, maybe for the first time. You see, when you live in a bubble, oftentimes we, you know, we, we stop questioning things and we start accepting things without much thinking. And that's what happens to Muslims as well. If you ask a Muslim who's living in Algeria, why are you a Muslim? He will answer, I'm a Muslim because everyone around me is a Muslim, because my father is a Muslim, my grandfather is a Muslim, I'm Algerian, I am a Muslim. But now, you see, if that person moves to Europe, all of a sudden, you know, people around him are not Muslims. This person is not hearing the call of prayer. People around him don't dress like Muslims. People that work with him are not Muslims. And the first, for the first time, this person is going to be asking himself the question, why am I a Muslim? This is the first time he has to answer that question. He never thought of this question before. It wasn't even an option. You see, the movement of people open a great opportunity to get to the hearts and minds of people. So when I look at the movement of people, I see God's hands at work, shaking the faulty foundations that people stand on so that they can discover who they truly are as human beings and find hope in Christ. In verse 27 of that same uh, chapter that we read, Paul says, God did this so that they would seek Him. God is moving people and determining where they were to live and when. He's doing this that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He's not far from any one of us. You see, God is at work and He invites us to join Him in what He is doing. And guess what? Because of the current actually pandemic situation, people are more open to talk about spiritual things. Many have come to Europe thinking that Europe is the solution, only to find themselves without work, having to face a deadly virus and be confined to their homes. Some of the immigrants were so desperate that they even paid the mafia to take them back to their home countries. Yes. Friends, we know that the solution to people's deep problems is found in Jesus. Our security, our value, our significance is found in Him. You and I know that Europe is not a better place nor a safer place for people. It might offer them a temporary solution or a temporary comfort, but unless people come and meet Jesus, they have no hope. The hope is not in the European countries or in the European economy. The hope is not in a better job or a better health system. Real hope is only found in Jesus Christ. That's why we are committed to sharing Jesus with people. We believe that if we don't reach out to them, we will lose them to secularism, atheism, and in many cases as well to radicalism. Believing that this is a Kairos moment. We believe that this is an opportune moment. This is why we have different teams um, throughout Europe. They work again with refugees and immigrants. They meet felt needs, but also they share the good news of the gospel. Uh, this is why we work with so many churches as well here in the region. And we praise God for the opportunities that He has given us to train 
uh, churches, hundreds of believers just this last year were trained in how to reach out to Muslims. Uh, people are beginning to see the, the great opportunity that is laid before us. You know, and the beautiful thing about the diaspora ministry is that it spills out to outside. It doesn't, if you're reaching out to the diaspora people who are living here in Europe, then you're also able to reach their parents and their neighbors and their friends back home. Uh, just a quick example on that is the story of my friend Ali. I had the privilege of baptizing Ali um, years ago here in Barcelona. His story is interesting. His, his, brother, uh, his brother moved from Iran. He's from Iran, moved from Iran to the United States. And his brother came to know the Lord in the United States. And he started sharing with his brother, with Ali. And Ali was living in Iran. He had a lot of doubt. He had a lot of questions, a lot of rejection. But God eventually opened his heart and he became a believer. And this happened three years before we met. But then during this whole time, he wasn't able to get baptized. It was very dangerous for him actually to do that in Iran. And this was his first trip outside of Iran. Three years after he'd become a believer. So he came to Barcelona. He was on a work trip. And he was working for three days and he had a free day at the end. So he picked the yellow book and started calling it random churches. He didn't speak Spanish. Uh, these churches didn't speak English, so they couldn't understand each other. Finally, he was able to call the church where my friend attended and my friend called me. And I just went there and I met Ali. And after I heard his testimony, I said, there's no doubt in my heart that this guy is a follower of Jesus. So we took him to the Mediterranean and baptized him there and then put him on the plane and he headed back to Iran. But when he went back to Iran, he was so excited. And then he started sharing Christ with his friends, with his family, and five people from his family, from a Muslim background, decided to follow Jesus and they became believers. Praise God for that. But this is the beauty of this. You know, when you reach out to the diaspora people, they play a great job at taking the gospel back home and reaching out to their neighbors and family and friends. So what is your role? You might be listening to all of this saying, this is great, this is awesome, but what is it that I can do? Well, first of all, let me thank you for what you have already been doing. I know from this church, many of you have been receiving our news, have been supporting us, whether by praying for us and for our family or giving financially. And I want to thank you for that. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that. My family and myself cannot be here and do the ministry that God has called us to do. If it wasn't for people like you who believe in this mission and who play active role in supporting us. So thank you for what you are doing. If you are not receiving our newsletter and if you are not uh, involved in, in, uh, in supporting uh, and you'd like to do that, we'd be happy as well to share with you. Um, our email and you can write us and we can put you on the list and uh, we'd like to hear from you as well and uh, if you're not praying for the ministry you can you can have a great role as well there in praying and in supporting giving financially as well there's some specific needs that you can give to and Lord willing after this pandemic is over uh, we'd love to see you here so if God lays on your heart as well to come and participate and be the hands and feet of Jesus here on the ground we'd like as well for you to be able to come and, and visit and we'd be happy to show you around and get to know you as well better. Again thank you for this great opportunity to be able to share with you this morning may God bless you and looking forward to hearing from you.